going to be talking about the Midwestern Hemp Database, using data to select compliant hemp cultivars. Um, so hemp is a new crop, um, and so because of that, we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to talk about hemp, an overview. We're going to talk about grain fiber production and how that might differ from other production systems. We're going to talk about the hemp database and really how it can be used to select compliant hemp. Um, and then if we have time, opportunities for research, um, ongoing research, excuse me, and opportunities for collaboration with some grower cooperators in the region. So the first thing first is to talk about what hemp is. So uh, the only difference between hemp and marijuana or non-medical cannabis is the amount of THC that can be found in the plant. And THC is the psychoactive cannabinoid um, that is commonly associated with intoxicating effects of marijuana. So if it's above 0.3%, it's considered to be marijuana or non-medical cannabis. And if it's below that 0.3%, Threshold, it's considered hemp, which is very important for growers uh, and consumers alike. Uh, hemp is primarily dioecious, meaning that there's both male and female plants um, in the given seed lot, uh, but there are some monoecious cultivars which are currently available, and this is important because it's going to influence uh, management decisions, and we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly here. Um, but hemp can be grown for uh, a wide var variety of things. It can be grown for grain, it can be grown for fiber, and it can be grown for flour, all of which will determine how you actually grow the hemp and which varieties you're sourcing. Uh, they're very different production systems. And you can see from the image here on the left, which is a grain fiber type production system uh, planted at a much higher density on narrow row spacing versus a cannabinoid hemp system for flour, which is on the right, which is much more like a specialty crop or a vegetable crop. Low planting densities, high row spacing, large row spacing, um, so they're very different uh, production systems. Regardless of what you're growing hemp for though, the material must be compliant to be, to be harvested, so it must be below that 0.3% threshold. So grain and fiber uh, provide some interesting challenges because how you grow the crop itself. So much like any crop that we grow, it starts as a seedling and develops through the vegetative stage into flowering and then through a senescence, pollination and then senescence. What's interesting though is if you're growing for fiber, you want to harvest right around anthesis or right around flowering. And then for grain, you want to harvest when that grain has matured. So depending on the end use of what you're growing the hemp for, it will determine when you plant, how you plant, and how you harvest. So something to consider. Uh, things about fertility, nutrient changes uh, with crop use, and depends on the crop, crop's intention. So whether it's for grain or fiber, that will change the nutrient requirements. Uh, for example here, uh, nitrogen fertility uh, is going to be typically higher in a grain production system. Uh, whereas, bless you, well, it will be higher uh, in a, a phosphorus and potassium rates will be higher in a fiber system given rates of removal. So when you're growing for fiber, you're removing the stalk and the stem material. You're taking pot phosphorus and potassium away from um, what could go back into the soil versus like grain, you're growing for that seed, that oil seed, which contains high amounts of nitrogen. So your nutrient requirements for that will be higher. Um, just a few planting and management considerations. This is a small seeded crop. It needs a, uh, that is basically needs to grow in an organic system uh, because there's no insecticides, herbicides, or pesticides currently labeled for this crop, which is very important for your management decisions when it comes to planting and weed management. So for example, um, it's a shallow seeded crop, only about a quarter to a half inch is typically, or three quarters, but typically a quarter to a half inch for seeding. And because it's a seed, small seeded crop, you want a tilled, packed, rolled uh, field a, with a firm seed bed to really allow uniform emergence and development. Um, importantly, trying to plant hemp after a rain instead of before a heavy rain, given the small seeded nature and issues with crusting, is recommended, although not always as, easier, as easy um, as we'd like it to be. Um, regardless, because this is, again, very similar to an organic system, Planting timing is going to be important, but also weed management, whether that's using a row cultivator, a rotary hoe, or a tying harrow. There are many early season weed management strategies available for organic and conventional producers alike. Um, so fiber hemp is uh, grown using traditional row crop equipment, uh, typically a grain drill or a modified planter of some kind, uh, but can be broadcast and incorporated. 
Um, seeding rates will vary depending on the variety, but what's really important to understand at this time is that harvest is going to be done at anthesis. So when the varieties are flowering is when you want to go in and chop them and allow them to ret or be uh, essentially a slow processing in the field before they can become baled. So this typically happens in mid to late July, uh, providing unique opportunities for uh, cover crops going into the fall. Grain, on the other hand, while it is uh, planted using similar equipment, seeding rates are going to be significantly lower in grain hemp, and I'll talk more about that soon as it pertains to the database. Um, but harvest is going to be done typically in mid to late August or early September, depending on the variety, and is done using a combine, typically a grain draper head type situation. Uh, a challenge with grain hemp is that given the issues with seed shattering and variable maturity within a field, um, harvest is typically done when about 70 to 80 percent of the seeds are actually mature, uh, and that's just the nature of the beast when working with small seeded crops. This is no different than working with things like canola, for example. Um, and so you harvest a little early to account for that, to maintain those yields and reduce losses to seed shatter. Um, so now that you kind of have an overview of what hemp is and kind of how it's grown from a commercial row crop industrial application standpoint, we're going to talk about the hemp database and how you can use tools that are currently available to make informed variety selections. Whoops, I am sorry and I realized this whole time that it wasn't on the proper thing. I am so sorry. A little late to the party here. Uh, so the Midwestern Hemp Database uh, provides ag agronomic uh, insight into uh, cannabinoid, um, or in provides insight into agronomic performance and cannabinoid development of industrial hemp cultivars. It's a repository basically for variety performance. So university variety trials have been conducted across the Midwest for the last few years, and we put all of our information into a publicly accessible tool that growers can manipulate to select specific data, performance on certain varieties, um, to see if they're a good fit for their region agronomically, but also are they going to produce compliant hemp that they can actually harvest at the end of the season. So this is just kind of a demonstration of what the database looks like and how the data can be accessed and manipulated for your use. So why is all of this important? Well, hemp is a new crop and information is still very limited on regional variety performance. So what variety should we grow? Um, in addition to that, best management practices are still being developed. We're talking about things like when to plant for fiber or for hemp. What are the fertility requirements? What are seeding rates and seed quality characteristics we need to be looking for? And while we're getting better at understanding these things, um, we still have a good way to go. Um, but really important for growers is regardless of the type of hemp they grow, they are required to grow a compliant hot crop in order to harvest it. If it's not compliant, it must be destroyed at their loss, at their cost. So it's really hard too because seed certification is underdeveloped, making picking compliant, high-performing varieties a challenge. And so this is where the database comes in. Um, so compliance testing... What you really need to know is that growers are required to either have uh, an inspection agent come to their field and sample their hemp before it can be harvested or submit samples to an um, approved laboratory prior to harvest. Uh, what I want to demonstrate here is the importance of sample location. Where you sample on the plant is incredibly important. As you move down the plant uh, from top to bottom, cannabinoid content, THC, CBD will decrease meaning that if you're taking samples to monitor for cannabinoids early in the season from a lower part of the plant, it will not be rep representative of what a, an agent or a sampling agent may come and sample from later on in the season. So it's really important to follow guidelines for sampling if you're going to be monitoring cannabinoids in your field throughout the season to make sure that you're doing what a sampling agent normally would. Uh, what I want to demonstrate here is the amount of data we've collected over the last few years for high cannabinoid hemp, and I'm going to talk more about industrial hemp applications in a second here. But what I really want to demonstrate here is that of the over 2,000 samples that were submitted over the last few years, 28% uh, of samples submitted were non-compliant. Uh, basically what this means is that all of these crops, if they had been grown and submitted to a regulatory agency, would have had to have been destroyed. 
this is a problem. We want to get varieties that perform either reliably below this threshold of 0.3% or produce significant cannabinoids in a way that growers can monitor them effectively and harvest them at the end of the season. So again, 28% of these seed lots would have had to have been destroyed if this was submitted for regulatory sampling. Uh, grain and fiber hemp is a little bit of a different story, but still similar. We see a t almost 9% or a little over 9% of the samples submitted over the last few years have been non-compliant. And so we want to provide growers with an opportunity to pick varieties that are going to perform high agronomically and also compliant. And so this is where the database is very important. Um, I'm pretty proud to discuss that the results of this data were actually used to inform the uh, final hemp ruling uh, for hemp production across the United States. And data from these projects were actually used and referenced in the legislature uh, and made several important rule changes for uh, growers. So we're pretty pleased about that, that growers are submitting data, universities are submitting data, um, so science is informing policy, and that's a pretty great thing. Uh, moving into seed certification, so currently seed certification is in its infancy in hemp. There really is not many good, reliable seed certifying agencies across the country, uh, except for agencies like AOSCA, or the Association of Seed Certifying Agencies. Now, while they are a great starting point, they are really a catch-all for industrial hemp. Um, they implore use of base requirements, which is a step in the right direction, but not necessarily certifying the seed themselves. They are stating that varieties are eligible for certification. So while this is a good start, we still have a long way to go. Um, also, while AOSCA does look at things like uh, uniformity and, uh, and specific traits and making sure that cultivars are performing the way that they should from a phenotypic standpoint, how they look, they don't factor in cannabinoid development, so compliance, or yield metrics, things like performance. Uh, so the Midwestern Hemp Database itself has three sources of data, university research trials across the Midwest, grower cooperator submissions, and the cultivar check program, which is a series of grower cooperator trials uh, across the Midwest. And all of this data gets put into the Midwestern Hemp Database. Um, our research station trials are conducted uh, at four universities, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, Michigan State University, the University of Wisconsin, and Purdue University. We run trials including variety performance and best management practices. The cultivar check program that I mentioned had over 32 growers uh, contributing data in 2022, and this is a map representing those locations, where varieties were sent to growers, they grew them for us, they submitted samples for analysis, and the results get shared and put into the Midwestern Hemp Database for you to use. So now getting into the good stuff, Why are we at, how can we actually use the data from the hemp database? Well, first off, we want to be able to select varieties that are certified, that are going to perform well from a germination standpoint, from a quality and uniformity, and that's really where IOSCA is going to provide you a good baseline. So we have a list of genetics here that have been IOSCA certified. So we take that data and we couple that with entries from the Midwestern Hemp Database looking at cultivar performance for cannabinoids. So here is an excerpt from the Midwestern Hemp Database with specific varieties, the number of entries that have been submitted to the database, and their cannabinoid development performance. Here we're looking at varieties that have below 0.3% THC across all samples. So you can couple the seed certification data with the data from the database, and now we're looking at seed quality, now we're looking at compliance, and the final piece of that puzzle is agronomic performance, right? How are they performing in my region? So here at the Midwestern Hemp Database webpage, we have links to the university station trials being conducted at all the universities where growers can get more accurate data on how they're performing in their region from a yield standpoint. So we can couple all three of these components from seed certification, compliance, and performance and put all of these together to create a kind of you know, matrix that you can use to make a variety selection. And I think all three of these are very important because they all answer three very different questions, none of which have been answered holistically by any agency or university that I'm currently aware of, and this is something that we're really proud of. So one other thing I want to talk about here as it pertains to using the database from a seed quality standpoint is that 
Hemp is all over the board when it comes to seed quality. Germination rates are typically very poor. There's high amounts of dormancy or noxious weeds that are found in these seeds, uh, seed samples when they get sent out. And so we, at we account for that in our trials and in the database entries. Um, just to give you an idea of how small these seeds are for hemp, um, it's pretty important. But I want to also mention that not all seed size is the same. So if you look at our entries from our, some of our variety trials, some of the seed weights or seeds per pound are nearly double, if not triple, what other seed varieties are. And that's really important when we're making seeding rate and of planting recommendations. So not only are not all seeds the same size, but they don't perform the same well from a germination standpoint. And so we have to factor in all of these things when we give a grower a recommendation as to how they should plant their hemp. And I'm going to talk about that right now with a few examples. So in 2019, when we were first learning to grow hemp, we talked about seeding rates of hemp and talking about pounds of seed per acre. Nowadays, we're talking about targeted seeding rates from a pure live seed perspective. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute with a few examples. But our way of thinking has changed a lot because pure live seed takes into account quality, germination, um, and uh, the amount of seed that you're actually applying, the seeding rate. Uh, same thing for fiber. In 2019, we were talking about how much seed in terms of pounds of seed per acre we should apply. But now here we are in 2023 and we're talking about pure live seed. How many plants per square foot should we be trying to achieve? So what do I mean by this? Let's look at a few examples here. And I'm going to kind of step over here because why not? Um, so pure live seed takes into account the seeding rate, pounds per acre, the seeds per pound, and then the germination. Okay, so for example, if we were to assume that we wanted to plant two grain varieties at 20 pounds of seed per acre using a base 20 pounds per acre rate, how many seeds um, per square foot would that be? So for A2, for example, we take a look at the seeds per pound, the germination rate, and the seeding rate, and that would be about 16 to 17 plants per square foot. If you apply 20 pounds of seed for the variety Hanola right here and look at its seeds per pound and its germination, we'd get a little under 10 plants per square foot. So a significant difference just in these, by planting two different varieties when using the base rate. Now this may not seem like a big deal, but it is, especially when you're doubling or tripling seeding rates. And look at something like this. I don't mean to call them out, but 25% germination from these seed lots, it's not great. The nice thing about doing this, though, is it allows you to account for poor seed quality. So even if seed quality is low, you increase the seeding rate, you can still accurately get a good representation of what you should have planting to get uh, your targeted seeding rate in the field. So let's go back again and look at that. Here, you can just see how our, our mindset has changed from going from seeding rates to pure live seed for, for grain systems and also for fiber systems. All of this data is available on the hemp database. We include germination rates, we include seeds per pound, and then if you're interested in looking at, again, how they performed in each region, the place to go would be the MHD. Um, I'm going to move forward into a couple things quickly to talk about some of the research that's being done here at the University of Wisconsin in the Ellison Lab, which is where I work with Dr. Shelby Ellison. The current focus is preserving, characterizing, and utilizing genetic diversity in alternative crops to meet the needs of Wisconsin farmers and farmers across the region. Um, what's really neat about this work is it includes new crops like hemp. And so just some of the projects that we're working on here, uh, for example, Dr. Adamola Aina, who is a, a great postdoc in our lab, has been working on feral hemp collections, going around the, the, the Midwest collecting wild hemp to evaluate it for, for fiber qualities and, uh, and trying to map certain traits so we can improve breeding populations for potential commercial cultivars. So these are some of the locations all over the Midwest that he's gone to make these collections uh, and the amount of plants that he's collected. We're gonna evaluate them in the greenhouse, evaluate them in the field, and hopefully improve our breeding program for the Midwest and beyond. If you know of any feral hemp locations, let us know. We like to come driving around, makes us feel like explorers. Walking. Have you been to Southern Illinois? Yes, we have. Okay. It's all over the place. It's all over the place. <laughs> We didn't have our licenses back then when we were down there looking, but now we do, so yeah, we're going Carbondale. back. Carbondale. Carbondale. 
well, come on down. Uh, he'll be happy to hear that. Uh, another thing that we're working on here is developing new tools to uh, assess diseases and identify them, quantify them, uh, using multiplex methods, which is basically a method of, of, of uh, quantifying multiple pathogens in a, in a single tool. Um, Dr. Derek Grunwald is working on tools like this um, and is very interested in, in pursuing further diseases for identification and quantification. We're looking at companion crops, which I find tremendously fascinating, um, given the, uh, the, the wonderful amount of insects and pollinators we find in hemp fields across uh, our trials, but looking at companion crops to evaluate their impacts on hemp or hemp's impact on these uh, companion crops as well, uh, specifically looking at things like insect populations and biomass of both the hemp and the companion crops. Um, one, uh, one more thing I'm going to talk about, we're looking at anthocyanin production. So Sean Kim is a master's student in our lab looking at pink purple pigmentation in cannabis and seeing uh, what specific stressors, cold, light, are influencing the production because this is a high uh, demand in the cannabis market is looking at pink pigmentation, uh, purple in uh, cannabis strains. Uh, and one other thing, last thing, the Wisconsin Crop Innovation Center, uh, the first group um, listed in the world who performed a successful transformation of uh, ge genetics into hemp. They inserted the crimson gene into the cannabis plant and it produced this kind of wild uh, red color. So this is the first um, uh, evidence of tra successful transformation in hemp. It's pretty cool. I actually got to see this plant in person and it looks as red as it does here. Um, cooperative grain and fiber trials, so this is opportunities to work with us. Um, for both grain fiber and CBD type hemp, we have grain uh, trials that are available for growers to participate in. Um, for our grain and fiber trials, we pay you $500 for, uh, to participate. We provide seed for the trials and we pay for any additional testing that you want to do. Um, if you are a licensed grower and you're growing hemp for us, you can harvest this grain for free. If you want to do this under more of a research type license, there's opportunities for that as well. Uh, but we need collaborators, we need good growers. So whether you've grown hemp before or, or not, we would like to talk with you if you have patience and want to learn how to grow a new crop. Um, we're getting better at doing it and be getting better at teaching people how to do it. So uh, certainly want to promote this. Uh, and then also the CBD type trials, the Cultivar Check program uh, is funded by SARE and is probably the reason why I'm here actually talking about this. All of these research efforts tie into the hemp database. So whether you're growing high CBD hemp or grain and fiber hemp, all of that information is available on the database. There's essentially two different databases all providing very similar information based off the type of hemp that you want to grow. Um, but the, the Cultivar Check program funded by the SARE Partnership Grant, uh, we just got the SARE Partnership Grant for another two years to continue this, but we send growers subsets of specific high-performing varieties. We pay for the testing, um, and we just require that they send us some pictures and some data back uh, in response. But we provide um, a significant amount of seed to make these trials worth it. If you're interested, please uh, contact me or use this QR code here. Um, all this information I've talked about is at our Emerging Crops website, including links on how to get involved with every single one of these trials. Um, we provide disease diagnostic services. We provide a variety trial reports, participation, um, opportunities to get involved. All that's available on our website, um, as well as resources, research reports, and other production slash videos. So um, I would like to say thank you to all of our growers. Um, we would not here, be here without them, and the same goes for SARE, who funded this work and has been instrumental in um, developing the database from what it was a couple years ago to where we are now, um, and to our many seed suppliers, growers, and collaborators all across the country. I am tremendously thankful. And I think it's kind of cool that we did all this during the middle of COVID, and for the first two and a half years, I hadn't met any of my partners in person. And it wasn't until this last year I got the pleasure to meet them all, um, and so we got to do all this together via Zoom uh, uh, since 2020. So it's been a great experience and I look forward to keeping uh, working in this field. So I'll answer any questions that you have. I appreciate your time and uh, thank you very much for having me.